Live at the show, John. And uh, the show, just so everybody knows, is on uh, the web at uh, accesssacramento.org uh, and on uh, TV at uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento, cable channels uh, all over the place. Uh, look up your, check your local listings for time and station. Uh, and uh, on YouTube and on Facebook. So uh, many, many different ways to consume uh, or to view Libertarian Counterpoint at uh, 8 p.m. Thursdays, noon Fridays, 4 a.m. on Saturdays, all uh, Pacific time. Congress should end the ability of presidents to conduct wars on impulse. That's my, uh, my uh, summary of a Syrian bombing that happened uh, last week. What's, what's your take on it, John? Uh, I absolutely agree. The we with the last declared war was World War II, if I remember 1941. correctly. 1941. 41. Yeah. And uh, the uh, authorization to use military force. Thank you for letting me know what those earlier. You let me know what those um, initials meant. Was done uh, after 9/11, when when. Uh, uh, patriotic fervor and uh, hatred of the foreign devils who had slaughtered 2,000 of our citizens and knocked down the gleaming towers of uh, capitalism in New York was at its height. And rather than um, get rid of it, you know, they've uh, renewed it. Yeah. Well, rather than declare war, Congress did essentially told the president, hey, do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Yeah. Do whatever you want. And I was hoping that, uh, that Trump uh, would would end the uh, drone killings of way more innocents than su even suspected terrorists. But uh, um, and again, I can't get clean numbers, but it looks like he's doing uh, more of it than more more than the droner in chief. The droner in chief. But then again, I'm um, loyal viewers. I'm not sure of those numbers because. Uh, it's so hard to get good information off the web now because all the search engines have a, a dog in the game, a dog in the fight. So it's really hard to get uh, clean information. Uh, but uh, what I found just with cursory skimming is that's the case. And I think it's horrible because um, war is a bad thing. And war is on foreign soil uh, where we, uh, we libertarians would say we certainly can't have a dog in the fight because uh, it's not our country. All the sides are bad. All the sides are bad. There are there are a lot of bad sides within our borders. Once you leave our borders, all the sides are bad. There are, um, you know, the rebels are bad. The the governments they're fighting against are bad. And if you look in in um, countries, and I I don't know if I I should use the word Muslim, but I will. Those countries, the one group is either fighting to hold on to a, a medieval state where where uh, there is no age of consent in many of these countries because the concept of consent is missing. Um, that um, that people basically don't have rights that we had even under English tyranny before we revolted. Uh, they're either fighting to keep that medieval theocracy or or to institute it. So why would we want to be part of that fight? And I think you know the big part of it is is that if you have a toy, you're going to play with it. And I don't mean to call the lives of thousands of American young men and a few young women toys, but you know, if if you give somebody drones and cruise missiles and fifty million dollar fighters and you train them, that you know, the urge to 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 put them to use is pretty strong, and the profit motive to put them to use is pretty strong. So you can build more of them, employ more people, uh, lobby more you know, in the halls of Congress to make sure that uh, the jobs stay there and your power stays there and everything else. And I think, uh, again, that, that uh, authorization to use military force should be rescinded. And, and I think the, the language around um, what institutes or what constitutes an act of war should be clearly defined as a use of military force beyond the U.S. borders. Yeah, it's, it's killing people and breaking things. I think yeah. that uh, it's, it's fa fair to say that the only winners of the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the first Iraq War, the second Iraq War, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Libya, the war uh, now in Syria, uh, and dozens of other uh, smaller conflicts around the globe in between, all of them without a declaration of war. The only winner in all of those conflicts is the military, industrial, intelligence, security, and welfare complex. That's the only winner. It's, mm. you know, what some people call the deep state, 
what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex, mm -hmm. which I've broadened to include intelligence and. Uh, oh, because yeah, uh, the, and intelligence, the in, w people who are employed in the intelligence community, you can't really get a hard number because it's all, it's, it's all, all dark budget. money. Yes, yeah, black budget. Yeah. So. And it's huge. Huge. Well, they, uh, you know, they, they had the, uh, if you ever actually looked at the OMB budget, they will add it all up, and it's everything that you can imagine. And you go, well, holy cow, I mean, we're only really spending $3 trillion. And then you look at the other mandatory, and that's all it says, it's an asterisk. Yeah. And that number is about $600 billion. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, everything's accounted for, Medicare, Social Security, yeah. all of that, you know, and then you look at that asterisk. And you know that that is, in addition to our whatever it is, seven hundred billion dollar actual or uh, declared military budget, that we're running another six hundred billion, at so, least. So, yeah. Richard, if you had just widened out that asterisk, you could have balanced the budget yeah. right there. You wouldn't have had to uh, <laughs> do all the other stuff. So, but yeah. Then, well, yeah. Then you can eliminate the income tax as well, which is, of course what they say can't be done, but it can. It's not, mm -hmm. it's, it's not rocket science. Uh, we're, buy, we're paying for an awful lot of stuff that benefits no one except for the people who live and work inside the Beltway or just outside the, the Beltway swamp? of Washington, D.C. The swamp, the, the uh, amphibians. The, the swamp, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, the amphibians and the reptiles. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Miguel Diaz-Canel uh, is the new uh, president of Cuba, succeeding Raul Castro. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a non-Castro family member in charge of Cuba for the first time since the Revolution. Uh, any changes uh, in the Viva la Revolution. Uh, any did changes that in the wind because of bad. that or, yeah. yeah, I know, bad accent. Any yeah. changes in the wind uh, or more, uh, same old, same old? It's a, a, a younger uh, communist. Um, he um, was born in 1950. Born I after think? the Revolution. Uh, well, he was, he wasn't of that, that ilk. Yeah. But he's a hand-picked right-hand man for the Castros. And so um, then he talks a little bit about um, making some change. But the, the change he would make would just be to make uh, the inefficiencies more efficient, which we know won't happen. And of course, uh, we, know not, that we know that Raul, although he's given up the presidency, is still the, uh, the head honcho of the mm -hmm. Communist Party of China, of Cuba, which of course calls the shots ultimately. Hmm. And they're having another election in 2021. But the, if you only have one candidate, um, it's hard to lose. It's it's hard to lose. Yeah. yeah. And a vote of no confidence, he's going to run the country anyway. So it's more of the same. And I, I think, you know, kind of like in Iran, um, the the youth are are dissatisfied. Some of them still have the zeal, you know, because they don't know any other way of thinking. But they can see that that what they have there isn't working. Um, on the other on the other hand, life on the ground, now that they have either killed or run off all of the people who were against the, the uh, Castro regime, mm. they're either in Cuba or they're dead, or I mean in Miami or they're dead. Mm. Uh, the people are you know are, are fairly you know, if you talk to people who are who have toured Cuba recently, mm. they'll say you know they're they're pretty happy. Mm. So uh, and of course part of that is they can't, they, af they can't afford not to be happy yeah. when it comes to the tourists. Uh, that would be probably dangerous. But the point is, one of the things that's kept the Castro regime alive as long as it has is the American embargo, because we are the automatic uh, fall guy for everything that goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Driving a 1950 uh, Chevrolet, well, it's because the Americans have an embargo. Uh, not getting your full <laughs> ration of meat and potatoes, well, it's all, it's all the Americans' fault. Mm -hmm. The best thing that we could do is end the embargo immediately uh, and uh, trade with Cuba just like we trade with the other communist countries that we trade with, like China, like the so like Canada. Russia, like <laughs> uh, all of, all of the uh, you know all of the uh, communist countries that we we do trade with, with no no compunction, no no qualms whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Trade, well, oddly, tra oddly, it trade's is a great um, equalizer. Uh, right. the, Cu the 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 Cubans want to trade with us less than we want to trade with them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, oh, there uh, there is an entirely different philosophy of life. Uh, so we are very interested. Anywhere we trade, we tend to, you know, uh, we tend to take it over. Uh, the reason we have embargoed uh, Cuba for so long is sugar. 
of all things. Well, it's, uh, we, it's a, a, a big it's, sugar lobby in Louisiana. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and uh, so our embargo is really to protect our some of our industries. Our crony capitalists. Oh, exactly. Same old story. But the Cubans aren't very interested in us. They're well, just not. I think that's probably at the, at the official levels because they, why why lose the bogeyman? Mm -hmm. Why lose the you know the uh, tourism the perhaps country. you know yeah. uh, but uh, by and large the Cubans have, just uh, don't care about us. <laughs> you wouldn't have Department of Homeland Security if they didn't have a bogeyman to keep you secure from. Exactly, so. exactly. Uh, Nebraska Senator Libertarian, I should point out, Senator uh, Laura Ebke, uh, on the last day of the legislative session in Nebraska, was able to get. Uh, a, an act passed that she was the author of and the prime mover behind is the Occupational Board Reform Act. Uh, the act is extremely uh, uh, thorough. It uh, uh, makes it necessary for uh, the for for, for uh, legislative committees in Nebraska when the legislature is not in session. So lobbyists are not as uh, prevalent in in, uh, in Lincoln. It makes it necessary for them to review 20% of all occupational regulations over a five-year period, 20% per year, and at the end of five years, review them all with two purposes. One purpose is, this an occupation that actually needs to be licensed? If not, get rid of the, get rid of the licensing. If it does need to be licensed or regulated in any way for any purposes whatsoever, it can be regulated by, it has to be regulated by the least intrusive means possible. Competition, maybe uh, certification, private uh, uh, agency self-regulation, sort of self-regulation, yeah. anything that can be done if it's necessary to regulate, regulate in the in the evenest, uh, softest way possible. Good Wait, thing. Uh, they, uh, we're talking about Jefferson and the uh, pursuit of happiness, which was originally written as a pursuit of property. Oh, if only Occupational that licensing changed. was a generation ago represented five percent of the total jobs out there. Now, so what, what five percent of total jobs were required occupational oh, yeah, licensing. Yeah. Uh, now that number is north of thirty percent. Yeah, it's one out of three. In, in and and I'll go way out on a limb here and challenge anyone to show me any occupation that should require a license. I know of none. When we think about how we do business with other people, I don't care if it's a financial advisor, I don't care if it's a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, you name Mechanic, it. I don't care how skilled, uh, how, 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 we, how we think this person needs to have gotten licensed. It isn't. It comes down to, did this person lose, you learn their craft, and do they have a reputation for doing a good job? So we have this licensing against contractors. Uh, Bolsom, they arrested some 30, men uh, about a year ago maybe two uh for working yeah well in nebraska it gets, it gets, here's how ridiculous it is in nebraska before this act was passed it hasn't been signed by the governor yet we'll see whether that happens when it was uh, uh before it was passed if you wanted to massage a person you didn't need a license if you want to massage a horse you have to get licensed. If yeah. you massage a horse without a license, you're subject to up to four years in jail and a $35,000 fine. Yeah. Who benefits? Well, there's a small group of people called veterinarians <laughs> who have decided they have right. a, a rightful monopoly on massaging horses. So if you take a look at any restriction on the right to earn a living, you'll find a guild, uh, you know, a Absolutely. throwback to a medieval guild AMA. that thinks, thinks they own mm -hmm. the right to, prop, to practice that law. Or and, it, that uh, you know, when you think about the effect, for instance, on uh, tax, tax revenue, you know, uh, between you, me, and the fence post, we've all got a guy, right? You know, when we need a home repair done or something like that, who can afford the contractor? So we have a guy. And that's all it is. And how does that per how does that guy get paid? He gets paid cash. You know, write a check. I don't know if you're declaring it on your taxes. Not my business. And so you create with occupational licensing where it should never be, and I would argue it should be, never be anywhere. That what you're creating is an underground economy. Uh, and when you create an underground economy, of course, what are you doing? You're avoiding taxes. 
uh, at the very, it may not be your intention to do that, but no, that but is a good, the byproduct. That's, a, that's actually a good by, uh, uh, byproduct. Well, that's what happens. And then, well, of course, what happens then, the need for revenue never goes away. So anything that can be captured is taxed even that mm -hmm. much more. Now, when you, when you yeah. talked about that, there, there's another thing. You mentioned contractors. What you do is you create two criminals in every transaction, the person who bought the illegal service and the person who provided it. In the state of California, the, the level for hiring a contractor, I think it's still $400. You can't get a licensed contractor to do a $400 job, even if you were to go try to find one and be willing to pay a premium because that person is a licensed contractor, they wouldn't take that job. So any job between about $400 and about $2,500 give or take, depending on the level of inflation, um, is done by a criminal class. And anyone paying to have that job done is, is also a criminal. So you create, what is it, three felonies a day? This would be a misdemeanor, probably. But so I, I would absolutely agree with you that um, one of the reasons that uh, medical costs are so high in this country is the, the huge uh, amount of hazing that you have to go through uh, in order to be licensed. Um, and in this country, the, the hazing is done in a completely different way than oh, it's, it's called a residency country. program. Well, right. residency program, medical school, all the rest of that. I mean, if you really want people who are cracking you open and have sharp objects in their hands messing with their, your innards to be sleep deprived, then our system is the one you want. But they don't do it that way in other countries. Well, and the other thing, you speak yeah. of cr the, you know, cr creating criminals yeah. through occupational licensing. The other problem is that bona fide criminals who want to get a job after they serve their time and are looking for a job are faced with, in Nebraska and probably other states as well, are faced with a, a, a situation where they have to, if they want to get a job, say, as a, as a barber or a beautician, they have to spend thousands of dollars uh, for going to beauty school, even though it's probably not going to have any uh, applicability to the actual job. And then they have to pass an, an exam, but they won't know until after they've spent the money and passed the exam whether or not they'll be accepted based on their criminal record because they've they got have to rules be against good moral turpitude character. and good character. Yeah. Those that, are the rules. I'd, I'd like to talk about that, in, <coughs> if you don't mind, in relation to what Pacific Legal Foundation yeah, go ahead. is doing. I mean, uh, Pacific uh, uh, Institute for Justice was uh, part of the drafting of the mm -hmm. Laura Apke bill. Uh, Pacific Legal Foundation has done some... I mean, state, IJ, Institute for uh, yeah, IJ, IJ, Institute yeah. of Justice. Uh, and, and Pacific Legal Foundation has done some spade work when it comes to actually litigating some of these laws mm -hmm. uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And now, not only litigating, we're getting in front of, of a lot of this legislation, and there, there's more of it rather than less. You would think people would finally realize that all these hidden costs are a huge burden on the economy. And I want to talk uh, about it kind of tangentially. We have um, two million people in prison in this country. And if you're a young black man, you have, I think, a one in nine chance of being in prison if you're between 18 and 34. And so if you have been in prison and convicted of a felony, which most of these people are, and you try to get a job as a contractor, um, as a, um, you know, get a nurse's license, uh, probably even be a barber, because so many things are licensed and regulated now, you won't be able to do that. And these are jobs that should be or, or in reality have very little barriers to entry as far as um, you, can, you can learn to do many of these jobs that you're prevented from doing, that you could actually learn in a prison training program pretty quickly by the very fact that you've been in this training, prison training program to learn the job. And what that means is that, that recidivism is directly tied to people's ability to do two things, and that, well, three things. Um, deal with authority figures, um, uh, take responsibility for their own actions, and then most important is have another means of earning a living. Most people who get out of prison, the only way they can earn a living is to do the illegal things that got them in prison in the first place. So it's a huge barrier to the, um, 
a big part of our population is disenfranchised because you also lose the right to vote. Yeah, and there's an economist at the uh, at Arizona State Univer or Arizona mm -hmm. University of Arizona, Arizona State University, one of the two, who has done some empirical research which indicates that the states with high barriers to entry when it comes to regulation uh, licensing laws mm -hmm. have a higher recidivism rate mm -hmm. because precisely because people who get out of prison don't have the ability to get into the trades. Mm -hmm. All right, absolutely agree. And Pacific Legal Foundation not only now is litigating in these areas, and our economic freedom attorneys, we have attorneys that specialize in, in bashing these barriers. And uh, they're very good at it. They're also very good at, at um, going to legislatures and saying this is the fallout from it, and kind of hinting that, you know, you can pass the law, but we're going to sue you, and we almost invariably win this kind of case. So, you know. I understand yeah. that uh, Pacific Legal Foundation lawyers are also getting uh, fairly good at uh, litigating in favor of the arts, and have particularly been, Starry Night mm, art. So, well, I'm not a, a big fan of Van Gogh, uh, but um, it, that's it's it's almost funny. In Mount Dora, and that lets you know uh, it's 161 feet high, and it's the highest place in Florida, which is another reason it's I don't live there. Yeah. It's a mountain. Um, a, um, a woman wanted to do something to entertain her alive in the life of her artistic son, uh, Miss Nimhauser. And so she had a, a uh, mural on a wall painted um, in the style of Starry Night. And local busybodies decided that that was graffiti and, uh, and a sign. And it was a legal signage and a legal uh, um, and because the, the wall didn't match the house, that uh, it had to be painted in a, in a color that's appropriate to the house. Well, this, this woman's pretty feisty. And um, she said, uh, they, they told her that it had to be painted one color. And she said, well, if you're telling me that I have to paint my house one color, I can tell you flat out, it's going to be a color that's visible from the International Space Station. She uh, dug her heels in and... Uh, and uh, Pacific Legal Foundation founder, and it looks like that this is a done deal in her favor, that, uh, that the local busybodies are running scared, and the initial judge's reading of it was that, uh, you gotta be kidding me, kind of thing. So, um, but, you know, Pacific Legal Foundation has, has fought for, art is, is, is a, a form of expression that, that uh, those on the left if it's long, is their kind of art favor and, and any interference with it is, uh, is frowned upon. But it's done all over the place. And the art of dance, if, if I can talk about it, is... is yeah, well, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, yeah. now that PLF is, uh, you know, a champion of the arts, let's talk yeah. about dance. Well, there's a young man, Freddie Linden, who's uh, uh, actually a, a nationally recognized competitive dancer. He's... Uh, will become a professional dancer. He's 15. He'll be on Dancing with the Stars. Well, he, he might be on So You Think He Can Dance, yeah. um, which is, or uh, Dancing with the Stars. He's 15, and, and I watched uh, a video, and if you go to Pacific Legal Foundation's website, you can see the YouTube of it. Um, it's a beautiful video about him dancing. And um, he was denied the ability to dance on his dance team because he was... His high school dance team. It's a uh, competitive dance team. Okay that crossing state lines because he was indeed male, which is... Uh, wait, wait, because he's male? Because he's Does male. that mean women are supposed to dance with only women? Or? Well, in these dance competitions, oh, okay. yeah. yeah. So it, that's a uh, patent violation of uh, one of those amendments that we hold near and dear, 14th, I believe. Yeah. So, uh, and how uh, South Dakota can decide that, that it can just pick and choose which amendments it follows, I do not know, but apparently, when it comes to dance, um, they can restrict boys from dancing. So is, uh, is South Dakota digging its, in its heels on this? Are they fighting back? Or well, they they're, they're, they're putting up a resistance that will be futile. I, I can say that right now. We'll, we'll win this one. Um, and uh, he'll, he'll get the right to dance. But not we he, as, I'm not an attorney. And but the, our our then, pit bull attorneys will, were... Will it happen, though, before he graduates from high school? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, oh, yeah. I, I would guess, and again, they'll probably get mad at me if any of our attorneys are watching because they hate people making promises because they have to appear before judges, and you know how that can sometimes go, that, that uh, he's 15, you know, in the next 
year or so he'll be uh, he'll be dancing and I would again suggest that people go to the Pacific Legal Foundation's website and, and watch the video on Freddie Linden because it's uh, artistically it's wonderfully done and it, it really does get the point across that uh, all he wants to do is dance and why should that be against the rules? Moving on to the national scene, uh, the uh, guy that got his start uh, officiating or getting involved in melees outside the wrestling uh, Rang at worldwide, whatever the heck it mm. is, wrestling, professional wrestling. I'm, I'm talking about that master entertainer, Donald Trump, mm. uh, has, is now getting into a fight with Amazon. Mm. Why would he want to be in a fight with everybody's favorite uh, merchandiser from the uh, internet? You know, I, I, when you're asking me why Donald Trump <laughs> does things, I am not a mind reader. That is not a mind I'd like to read. <laughs> now I must I must say from we talked about the regulatory state and its costs, uh, you want to balance the budget one more time. The 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 estimates on both sides um, are that uh, when they're the same side really, that the cost of regulation in this country approaches a trillion dollars basically. That's the, an, the in regulatory addition, state. in addition to taxes, just the compliance. The, the cost of, of regulation. Regulatory which, compliance. Regulatory compliance. Maybe half of that. When you look at the, the cost of all the boards and the yeah. people who, who enforce these laws and, and all the rest. So you could balance the budget right there by, you know, cutting that in half. And um, so Trump has been pretty good on, um, I'm, I know we're not a political show c picking a side here, on cutting right. regulation yeah. in some areas. Yeah. But why... Um, you know, people people uh, hate Amazon because Amazon doesn't pay taxes, but they actually but, but do. They do. Mm -hmm. And they hate Amazon because they put small businesses out of work. But I would say, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, if you're a small businessman and you want to sell a product uh, and you want to reach a national audience, you can do it through Amazon. Well, yeah. And, and the other thing is, it's not Amazon that he has a quarrel with. It's Jeff Bezos, the mm. CEO of Amazon, who is also the owner of the Washington Post, which is not... Mm -hmm been known for writing uh, adulatory uh, prose about the Trump administration or candidacy. Ken, I want to ask you a question. Are there any major newspapers in the country that have written adulatory prose about None, Trump? and uh, probably rightfully so, but mm. none of them are quite as exposed as is Jeff Bezos mm. as the sole owner, I mm. think, of, of the Washington Post. He's He's uh, got a, a number on his back, and Trump is making up all kinds of stories about why he should go after Amazon just to, just to settle a score. Well, and, and I think that's a very bad thing strategically because Bezos Bad thing could strategically. It's also a bad thing constitutionally. Mm -hmm. oh, ab the, you know, absolutely. But if, if, if you're a, a very rich man... You can do it. That's the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place. I'm the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much, my noted authors, poet and novelist, Philip Leroy and uh, John Cameron. Thank you. Thank for you very much for show. having us, Richard. Really enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Appreciated the heck out of it. Hmm? Appreciated the heck out of yeah. it, actually. Yeah. yeah. Now let's go drink whiskey. I'll drink mm -hmm. scotch. Oh, okay. That's a that's a variety of whiskey. It is. It's a it's a variety.